Old Testament and turn left. A couple of books. Praise God. The book of Joel, God is basically tells the tale of the fact that God is heartbroken over the condition of Israel. He is heartbroken that his people have lost their morals, that crime is rampant in the nation, that the land is full of violence, that many of the roles have been reversed, that that is evil is called good and that that is good is called evil. God's heartbroken. We need to always pray that the things that breaks God's heart breaks our heart. We need to have the heart of God in all that we do. And when you look at the book of Joel, you have to give you a little Bible study hint here. Some of you probably already know this. Some of you may not. That may not. Everybody may know it. When you're studying the Word of God, you have what's called the theory of double reference. Oftentimes, that that is prophetically spoken in the Bible for that time also applies to the time we live in. And Joel chapter 2 is a perfect example of this understanding. Because here, basically, is what he's talking about for the most part in this, in this chapter 2. We're going to try to go through every verse. And, and I'll try to be as, as brief with that as I can. I want to hold you long. Preachers always say that, and then they go and preach what they want to. But I believe that this is a direct reference not only to what is going on in the nation of Israel at that time, obviously, or Joel wouldn't have prophesied it, but I believe it's an exact description of what's going on in the United States today. Not really only the United States, the entire world for that matter. But especially speaking here, I believe that Joel chapter 2 is a message for today for America. And I'm not getting political here today. I'm not going to get into uh, uh, a political opinions on some things, although I may cover some political ideas. It's not that I'm trying to change your way of thinking on things. I'm trying to show you what the Word of God says. And so this descriptor that I just gave you, the lack of morals, divorce rampant, crime, violence, specifically role reversals of good being called evil and evil being called good, that is a descriptor of the modern day world we live in right now, most especially here in the United States. The United States is a world leader in many things. We have accomplished more than any other nation on the face of the planet. And we have done that because we've always honored God first. And that is quickly falling by the wayside. That is quickly disintegrating right before our eyes. We cannot compromise what we believe with any political party. And I'm not here to, again, to, to pick up one or down the, with the other. Both of them need a lot of work. Both of them are corrupt. Both of them have, for the most part, have for their best interest in mind. They go to Congress probably with some noble ideas and some great ideas about what they're going to do for this nation. And the corruption is so great in the nation's capital, in the state capital. The corruption is to a level that you cannot imagine. And I'm not including everybody in that, but I'm going to say probably 90% of the government is corrupt. Our nation is great because of the fact that at one time we put God first. And the further we push him back on the shelf, the further we push him back, 
the greater this nation goes down. But there's good news. There's good news. Last week we talked about prophecy and why we have prophecy. And I believe that Joel chapter 2 tells us a tale of what's going to happen in this nation prior to the rapture. And I believe in the rapture. I believe the rapture could happen any second. I will never stop looking for the rapture. The Bible says to watch and be sober and watch for the rapture. It doesn't say rapture, but it, it talks about the coming of the Lord. So I'm always ready to do that. But I'm also hearing and feeling in my spirit, and I know what God is saying to me about revival. And we're always talking in the church about revival. We're always seeking that great revival, and that's not wrong. But the condition of the church, unfortunately, has been infiltrated by much of this same corruption. And I don't like saying that because you know I'm a defender of the church. You know that I believe that a born-again believer needs to be in a house of God. They need to have a particular house of God that they're called to where they can not only go to and attend, but they can serve there, they can bless that ministry, they can work their work for the kingdom of God in that church. I believe that with all my heart or I wouldn't be standing here. And I'll fight for that to the day the Lord lets me draw my last breath. And I get a little bit upset when people begin to try to circumvent the church and begin to criticize the church. Well, the church is full of hypocrites. The church is not doing this and the church is not doing that. The church is the only entity I know of that criticizes itself. And we, we, we should. We're not exempt. And we're subject to, to mistakes. We're subject to doing things incorrectly. We're, we're subject to uh, being human like anybody else. But I focus, those who truly love the Lord, those who really have a heart for God, are serving somewhere in a church today. You have some out here that want to be lone rangers, and they want to go out here and do their thing. And I'm not necessarily against what they're doing, but I don't see how you can exclude the church from that and stay in the game plan of God. And that's my opinion. Some of you might not agree with that. Some of you might even get mad at that, but that's, that's my opinion on that. You can't be a lone ranger and serve God. I don't believe you can. All right. Said enough of that. Let's go to Joel chapter 2. And I'm going to read it verse by verse. I may skip a couple of verses in here that I'm not going to make points on. But you need to go home. When you go home today, sometime today, you need to read this whole book, this whole chapter, this chapter 2. You see, one of the problems in the church today, before I get to that, one of the problems in the church today is that we have been bullied. You may remember in school, you, you may have been one of the bullies. You were either a bully or you were bullied or at least attempted to be bullied. That was just life in school that I grew up in. The church has been bullied by a certain group of people, I just call them non-believers, have tried to bully the church into thinking like they do, or at least not making a fuss about how they think. And that's why you have much of what's going on in this country right now that you have going on. That's why things are getting so ridiculous. I mean, sometimes I read the news and I'm going, we have gone totally, absolutely insane. Men saying they're going to be pregnant. I got a news flash. It ain't happening. We have gone insane and we have allowed this, this radical opinion of what we believe to be bullied to the point they don't care what we believe as long as we're silent about it. Don't tell anybody about it and certainly don't get on social media. Certainly don't make a fuss with anybody. We've been bullied. And I, and I grew up in the school system around here. It's a pretty good school system when I grew up in it. But even the good school systems have bullies. And I guess my future work in law enforcement began in school because I always took up for the kids that got bullied. 
It was my nature to do that. I would go out on a, on a playground, and I'd look, and if I saw a kid by himself, I'd go over there and try to be his friend. I'm not boasting on myself. I'm pointing out something here. Bullies do the same thing. They look for somebody that they can push around. They look for somebody that they can impose their will upon them. And that's not right. And it's certainly not right for the church to allow that to happen to them. Because when they begin to bully someone, the first thing that person does is they withdraw. They withdraw from everybody else. They withdraw from maybe even their parents, the teachers, their, their lessons. They withdraw all from all of that. They withdraw into a shell. And that's where the church has been pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. Till we were just about saying, now wait a minute. Enough is enough. Something we should have said 30 years ago. Enough is enough. And I'm not talking about going out here and being radical and, 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 and causing riots and that type of thing. That's not going to solve anything. But we got to stand up for what we believe. We got to, we got to make sure that what we believe, we don't back off of for nobody. Just like that bully, you just look him dead in the eye and go, well, you're going to have to do what you got to do because I'm going to do what I got to do. Bullies can be stopped. Bullies get stopped when you stand up to them. And the church has got to start standing up. I am going to get to Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Blow you the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh for it is nigh at hand. I'm here to tell you that the day of the Lord is nigh at hand. Now, I'm not saying it's going to happen today. I'm not going to say it's not going to happen today. I truly believe that there's going to be a season of revival first. But again, the Bible says no man knoweth the day than the hour. So the first thing we see here in verse 1 is that God sounds an alarm. God never judges anything without warning first and given opportunity and then opportunity on opportunity to repent. When judgment comes, God always allows a season to allow them to repent. He even gave Jezebel, the spirit of Jezebel in Revelation, he said, gave her time to repent. We're in that time right now. It's time for the church to repent. Okay, we've made some mistakes. Okay, we've done some things wrong. Okay, maybe we hadn't been as strong as we needed to be. But we repent of that and we stand waiting, Lord God, on you to do what you want to do. You see, he's not going to come back for a church that's all separated and all messed up, all weak and full of strife and conflict. Yes, I'm talking about the church. You see, that kind of church knows about the power of God, but they don't have a clue how to use it. The Bible says they have a, a knowledge of power, but deny the use thereof. We've got the power, but we've got to be right with God. We've got to be taking care of God. We've got to stand up for that that is right. A lot of churches, they know about the power, but they don't, they're just not able to utilize it. They're not able to obtain it because they don't understand enough of the Word of God to be able to do so. And that's so evident in many of the churches today. And I'm not uh, sitting here boasting about Crossway Church. I, I love this church. And yes, we try to do things by this Word. That Word says it, we believe it. The end. But the power is already there. You can have all the power in the world to stand up to a bully, but if you don't use that power, then that bully is going to have his way. A church is divided right now. That's the truth of the matter. Verse 2. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. If that's not talking about the United States, I don't know who is. 
The United States is in relation to, you'd have to do a comparison kind of thing. The nation of Rome was very powerful during its day. Babylon and, and Greece and all the great nations of the past were great. But it says here, great people and a, you see, most of those nations are great because they had great armies. And they had some leadership that was, mankind would say was great. But it says here in chapter, verse 2, it says, a great people. Now, why are we greater than anybody else? Not because we're better than anybody else, but we're greater than anybody else is because of what we've been able to accomplish because we've had God taking his place in this country. Something that no other nation has ever done outside of the nation of Israel. Not to the extent that the United States has. Now, there are some that had other gods that they've certainly put on a pedestal. But if they're not real gods, that's pretty useless. We serve the only God there is. The only real God. America is strong today as a result of that. And those next uh, ten verses make reference to that. Verses uh, uh, 3 through 11. I guess that would be nine verses. Eight verses. They make reference and make you understand that we could very easily be talking about a double reference here the United States in the present age that we live. He's giving, he's giving us an opportunity as the church. He says, I'm put, I have put you in place. I have placed you in a place of authority. I've given you godly authority. And you're not using it. And he tells us in those verses there, he says, call a great assembly together. In other words, go to church. Go to church. You can't represent God staying at home on Sunday morning. You can't represent God when you're at the football game on Saturday morning or you got a little league game going on and parents are taking their kids out of church to go play little league baseball. There ain't a man in here who loves baseball any more than I do. But when I coached, you didn't, you didn't play on Sunday, you didn't play on Wednesday nights. But you see, that's how things have changed. You go right now, and they're, they're playing soccer over there at Wallace Field, I guarantee you. It doesn't matter what the sport is. It has no place being in front of God. He says, call a great assembly. Bible makes reference to assembly, and that usually means gathering in a house of worship. And people just ignore that. If I don't fit their agenda, then I'll just, you know, I don't need to go to church. I'll go out here and under that tree and do church. Like my neighbor told me one time. He said, I can have church underneath that tree. I looked him dead in the eye and I said, You ever had church under that tree? And he said, No, I haven't. So you're not going to church. You're not having church. The church can't be strong if we don't stand upon every principle of that word. We can't discount what we don't like. We can't discount what is inconvenient. We can't discount what might cost us something. That's backing off the bully. That's letting the bully have his way. Well, you don't do that no more, and you're backing up all the time. He ain't gonna, he ain't gonna put much work stock in what you say. Stand up to bully, you gotta stand your ground. I said, leave him alone. Get your hands off of him. Get your hands off God's church. Quit putting God's church down. Now we're not perfect. Oh goodness gracious, we have a lot of issues we need to take care of every church does but the first thing we have to do is we have to stand up to the devil we have to stand up where our battle is not against flesh and blood but against powers and principalities there's a war going on in the heavenlies right now in over this city and we've been involved in that in this prayer group we've been involved praying for this city my heart is for this city to come to Christ like never before 
not so that we can get a pat on the back, not so everybody can say, oh, look over here, this little church over here, what they did. No, it's not about that. It's about Jesus Christ winning souls. It's about Jesus Christ coming into hearts and lives. It's about Jesus Christ changing people. So we got to stand up to that bully. Verse uh, 12. Therefore also, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and great of greatness, great of kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. He gives us faith to search our hearts. We just did that a moment ago. But that's something we should do every day. We should be searching our hearts. Okay, God, what is it in me that's not right? Lord, I know I, I, know I love you. I know I'm saved. I know I'm on my way to heaven. I'm, I'm doing the best that I can do. But search my heart and show me what I can do better. Because if you get too proud for yourself, if you get too proud of who you are and what you're able to do, and you spend more time patting yourself on the back than you do getting down on your knees, then there's a lot that needs work there. There's a lot that needs work in all of us. Because no matter what you give God, He wants a little bit more. You might say, well, He's kind of selfish. Well, He is when it comes to you. He loves you that much. Because whatever you give him, there's going to be a blessing on it. Verse 14, who knoweth if he will return and repent and have a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and the drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, and call a solemn assembly. Go to church. Call a solemn assembly. That's not a suggestion. That's a command. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that, that suck the breast, let the bridegroom, bridegroom go forth in his chamber and the bride out of her closet, and let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not that inheritance to reproach, that the heathen shall rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? You read that again, verses 14 through 18. That's exactly what the church needs to be. That's a message to the church. You see, the non-believer doesn't read that. He's not going to read the Word of God anyway. He ain't got time for it. He's too busy playing soccer. He ain't got anything against soccer except it bores me to tears. You get my drift. Those verses tell us what we're to do. And we're trying our best. I believe in my heart we're trying our best right now to do that here at Crossway Church. But we have to get everybody on board. Everybody has to, to want to be part of that. You see, I can talk you into doing something, but if I talk you into it, then you ain't really got your heart in it. I can put a guilt trip on you like some people do with people. Well, if you're not doing what I'm doing, then you ain't doing nothing. Oh, okay, well, I'll come do what you do, so I'll be doing something. And then shame me if you don't. What's right about that? It right there tells us what to do. And that's what we're doing. We're praying, we're fasting, we're, we're believing God. We're calling the solemn assembly together. So that we can stand up to the bully. Stand up to the intimidation of this world. You see, it's easy for us to sit in here right now. And, and we're here with like believers. And, and we believe at least partially alike. At any rate, we all are, are, are born again believers. I believe everybody here is a born again believer. I may be wrong. But everybody in here is a born again believer. So we all believe in Jesus. But if we allow differences to come between us 
and serving God? Are we really serving his purpose? You say, well, that's the problem with the church today, Brother Mullen. We've got too many denominations. That's probably true. But if you'll remember, Jesus left a word for seven different churches in the book of Revelation when he talked to John, when he gave John the revelation. He talked to John Revelation. He talked to seven different types of churches. So don't tell me God didn't know we are going to end up in denominations. I'm not saying denominations are God's perfect plan. But I believe God can work with that. And one of the problems they have right now, when they start having great revivals, the problem you have is that the church gets involved in these revivals and some man somewhere wants to take the helm and he wants to be the leader. I'll be the leader. Y'all follow me and do as I do. And I believe, I don't know how God's going to do it. Only God, can, only God can know this. But I believe that we're heading into a time where God's going to split the church right down the middle. And I preached this 20 years ago and I'm preaching it again today. The church is about to split like never before. Because you're either going to stand up to the bully or you're going to side with the bully. You see, a bully never does much of anything. He doesn't have an audience. The bully wants a couple of his buddies to be there with him to maybe, you know, just in case things get out of hand, he has to really do something to somebody. He has to deal with somebody besides the little snotty-nosed kid that no way he could hope stand up to him. And he's got his little audience. He's got his little entourage, and they go everywhere he goes. If he wants to pick on somebody, okay, come on, guys, watch this. Watch me be, watch me humiliate this kid. It's a problem in the schools, and that's not what I'm preaching about. It is a problem in the schools. It always has been. And they don't like it when somebody stands up to them. Take your best shot, big boy. Well, that's what we need to tell the devil. Take your best shot. We're here for God. We're here for Jesus Christ. We're going to stand up to Jesus Christ. God, I, can, I can stand here in this room with all these like believers, and I can stand up to the devil pretty good. But you get back out there on that street. You get back in the workplace. You get back in the schools. You get back in the home sometimes. You get back in your neighborhood, and it's not so easy to do because people are going to look at you. They're going to, they're going to judge you for judging them. There is the biggest myth in the church you're not supposed to judge. That's hogwash. Excuse my English. You judge things every day. You get up in the morning and judge what you're going to have for breakfast. I'm serious. The Bible doesn't tell you not to judge. It says judge as you shall be judged. In other words, be a fair judge. And that doesn't, and you, you know, I can't, if I judge Larry's behavior, I can judge that behavior. I can't judge Larry because I can't pass sentence on him. I can't, it's not my job to, to punish uh, him for doing wrong if he does wrong. God is the only judge that can do that. And I'm telling you, God's getting ready to judge some things. I don't know if you've noticed. I don't know if you've been paying attention. I can't count all the politicians, most of them state representatives, that have been arrested in the last year. And more to follow. And it'll get on a national level, and you're going to begin to see some of them resign at a rate you've never seen before. Why? Because God's getting ready to judge this world. Before this revival begins, the bully's got to be put in his place. The bully's got to know that he's not in charge. See, that's the first thing you do to a bully when you stand up to him. You let him know, hey, you're not calling the shots here anymore. You're through doing that. You're through tormenting this kid. You're through doing that. That's a done deal. That's over with. Now, he may sit there and grit his teeth and act like he doesn't believe you. But I'm telling you, when you stand up to a bully, their knees begin to wiggle a little bit. God's getting ready to shake the knees of the enemy. 
He's getting ready to shake this city up. He's getting ready to shake this nation up. He's getting ready to shake up this world. You mark my words. God's getting ready to bring judgment. You're going to begin to see people fall like you've never seen before. Hollywood is about to be judged. They're going to not only they're not only going to judge Disney. They're going to he's going to judge Hollywood. And I'm not talking about us doing the judging. I'm talking about Jesus Christ, the judge, doing the judging. He's going to bring some judgment to the now time. I'm talking about there's going to be a great day of judgment. There's going to be a white throne judgment. But I'm telling you, God's getting ready to judge this nation. He's going to save this nation for a season so that that revival can begin. That's what Joel chapter 2 is talking about. And you get to watch. You get to be part of it. But you're going to have to take a stand for who you are in Christ. Because the weak church, the church that gives in to everything that the enemy wants. Anybody that saddles up with that, you're choosing the wrong side. They're not going to win. They've had their heyday. They'll even have a resurgence once the rapture happens. But until this season is over with, God's getting ready to bring some judgment on this nation. Those things that have been hidden are about to be revealed. The Bible tells us very clearly that everything will be revealed. There's going to be some very well-known names that are either going to pass, and I'm talking about dying, are they going to be fired? Are they going to be arrested? Are they going to resign? Mark my words. Mark my words. There's going to be a, a shaking of this nation like never before. Now, I'm not speaking for my own prophetic sense. I'm speaking what I've heard. I can't count how many prophets that have said that very thing, but I feel it in my bones. I feel it in my bones. I feel what they say. See, I don't just believe everything everybody says, but the Bible says that God doesn't do anything that he doesn't reveal it to his prophets first. If you're following a prophet, just make sure he's a true prophet and not some procrastinator out there. Prognosticator, not pro. <laughs> Said that wrong. Prognosticator. Anybody can watch the news and make some predictions. I'm telling you, it's about to get real, folks. It's about to get real. Don't don't be late. Don't be sitting back. Well, I'll wait till things really start shaking up before I get involved. No, you need to be. You need to stand now. You need to take your stand now. You see, you were born for such a time as this. Everybody in this room, from the youngest to the oldest. See, I pointed at the youngest, but I wouldn't dare point to the oldest, okay? I'm smarter than that. <laughs> from the youngest to the oldest, we've got to take a stand. You say, well, uh, you know, I, what can I do? First thing you can do is you can believe that word of God. Second thing you can do is you can make yourself part of what that Word of God says to do. Right. Doesn't mean you've got to get out here and, and do a particular thing. It means you obey God in all that you do. It means you listen to what the Spirit of God is saying to your heart on a daily basis. When He tells you to move, move. When He tells you to do this, do this. If you're ignoring what God's telling you to do in your life, you're not paying attention and you're not fulfilling what God has put you on this planet to do. There's more to live in this life than pleasure. And I'll be honest with you, once you get to a point where you begin to really serve God and you really begin to enjoy serving God, that'll bring you a pleasure you've never had before. God's not against you having a good time. He's not against you having pleasure. But if that's all you're living for, then where is your relationship with Jesus Christ? Where is that in your category of uh, uh, priorities? Is God even on your scale? Get behind. 
All right. Verses 18 through 22, and I'm not going to read them. I'm running out of time here already. Basically, God will have pity on you no matter where you've been or what you have or have not been doing. God is a, is a long-suffering God. This preacher wouldn't be standing here if he wasn't a long-suffering God. The times that God dealt with me throughout my life that I would not surrender to him, he waited and he waited and he waited on me. And I can't ever thank him enough for that. But sooner or later, sometimes God runs out of patience. I don't think he ever runs out. Let me re-say that. I don't think he ever runs out of patience, but he says, that's it. That's, that's enough. You see, that's where he's at with this nation. That's enough. He's given this nation time to repent, and this nation has done nothing but get worse and worse. And we're still one of the greatest nations that ever was. But something's going to happen. Verse 23. Let's skip down there real quick. Be glad, be glad then, the children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately. That's what we're in now. The moderate form of rain. And he will cause to come down for you the rain for the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat and the vat shall overflow with wine and oil, and I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm and my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. He's talking in double reference here to the church of today. All of this about the wheat and the wine and the oil, that is a reference to prosperity. There's going to be a window here. There's going to be a season that God is about to pour out his spirit upon this earth. He's about to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And the result of that is going to be an unprecedented revival in this country. The people that probably would have never gotten saved before will be coming to the Lord. So those lost loved ones that you've been praying for don't ever give up. I told the prayer group last Tuesday night, we prayed, and I felt something shift. I felt just the atmosphere of the room shift. And since Tuesday, I've seen prayer after prayer answered. I'm talking about prayers that I've prayed for months, years. And God made it happen. Not only for me, but for other people in other circumstances and situations as well. There was a shifting that was like, okay, God says, okay, now's the time to begin. You never want to miss out on the beginning of a race because if you do that, then you're going to be always trying to catch up. We're here for the beginning of the race. The shifting is taking place right now. It's shifting in this town. You see, there are strongholds in this city. I've lived here all my life. And all my life, I've tried to get out of here. And it just never worked out that way. Until finally one, God, one day God told me, he said, you've never been able to get out of here because I didn't want you to leave because this is where you're to minister. And so I got to thinking, well, if this is where I'm to minister, then God must have a plan because I'm not seeing it right now. My eyes were not beholding the plan that I think God has, but that's what faith is all about. And he's telling us here that the latter rain will be supplied. Latter rain makes reference to the harvest cycle in Israel. The former rain comes and, and, and it uh, uh, anoints the seed that is in the ground. And then there's a growing season and then right before harvest time there's another rain that comes. The latter rain comes and when that happens the harvest just gets a boost and the harvest is ready to be harvested. If this world ever needed a great revival is now. There have been other great revivals in the past, and they've all served a particular purpose. God doesn't do things arbitrarily. He doesn't just sprinkle a little here and a little over here. Everything God does is meticulous, planned out, and a purpose. 
When you read the Bible and you read all those uh, 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 so-and-so beget, so-and-so who beget, so-and-so who beget, so-and-so, all of that's for a purpose and reason. It's not just thrown in there for fodder. Everything in that Word of God is written there. Every, every period, every comma, every translation that is decent translation at any rate is, is translated that because of every word is important. God's getting ready. He said the time of the bully is going to be set back. Now, I'm not talking about the tribulation period. There will be a tribulation. I believe in the rapture, and I believe in a seven-year tribulation period that the church won't be here for. I believe the church will be out here for that. Okay, that's my belief. If you don't believe like that, that's your privilege. You can believe it any way you want to. You can even be wrong if you want to. But I believe that this season is the season we're in right now. Well, how long is it going to last? The Bible doesn't say. No one knows the, man, know the day or the hour. So we don't know how long it's going to last. But it's just like harvest season. When it's time to harvest, you don't take a vacation. You don't go to Florida while your wheat's about ready to be harvested. You set everything aside. Put all your games aside. It's, it's, you know, unless you're at church going, man, it's pretty much a seven-day week. Every week until the harvest is done. That's the season we're in right now. We're in a season of harvest. It's getting ready to harvest. What do you do when you get ready to harvest? You get all your equipment. You get everything that God's provided you with, and you prepare it. Every spring, I had to bring out the old lawnmower. Got to sharpen them blades. You got to get that lawnmower ready to harvest that grass. Y'all know me and my mowing. But you can't just go out there and jump on that old lawnmower and expect it to crank. It's been setting up. I wonder it might need battery charge. There might be need some oil in that thing. You have to prepare. That's where we're at right now. Get your equipment ready. Let's let's move on. Psalms 1 and 3 says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Imagine, if you will, and if you've ever been out west, you can appreciate this. I love the desert, and I love the mountains. I love the, uh, the forest and the mountains. But sometimes you get in those areas where you go from mountains down into desert just all of a sudden within five miles you you drop 8,000 feet or so and you're down in a valley and you're in this desert place but you look over there along the side of the road and there's green growing and where that road goes there's green as you're going down that mountain and you realize that since it's green that probably means there's some water there that is feeding that brush trees or whatever it is that's growing there along the edge of that water. That's what this verse is talking about in a spiritual sense. We're to be like that tree by the water. We're not, we're not to be dry. The church is dried up in, in much instances. You go to some churches and it's nap time. You go to some churches and they don't want anybody new coming in because that'd mess up their apple cart. They'd have to change a roster or something. You got some churches that are, are doing a great job out here and really reaching this city. But then you have some, they're satisfied with the status quo. Don't preach on this, it'll offend somebody. Well, I, I don't like offending people. But God, I got to preach what God tells me to preach. And if this steps on a toe, I'm not going to apologize for it. I love them and I care, care about them. I, I, that's why God had me say that. If you've ever had your toe stepped on, don't reject it. It may be wrong, but it may not be wrong. It might be exactly what you needed to hear. And so God wants us to be like that tree by that living water. You got That living water represents the Holy Ghost. And that tree soaks up. It's not directly in the water, but it's next to it. It says beside the river. And it draws nutrients from that water. It feeds on that. Your spirit man feeds on water. 
the water of the Word, the water of the Holy Spirit, and it feeds your soul. And it, it, it feeds you something that you can't get out of your refrigerator. It gives you what you need, and that makes you grow in God. If you're not growing in God, if you haven't, you know, if you're the same person you were last year, something's wrong. You're not getting fed, or you're not, you're not eating, one of the two. Sometimes people get fed, they just don't eat. I don't like that. My wife says I'm a picky eater. I'm not either. Not that bad, am I? What you, what you eat, I'm not going to finish this today, so I'm going to go ahead and make this point. What you eat, you've heard the saying, you are what you eat. Spiritually speaking, you are what you eat. And if you're not getting fed, you need to be changing your diet, your spiritual diet, and you need to get fed where you can grow. Where you can be more of who God wants you to be. Because if you're the same person you was last year, you're not growing at all. What would you do if your little four-year-old was like that? You'd take him to the doctor, wouldn't you? He's four years old, he ain't grown an inch all year. What's the matter, Doc? What are you feeding him? That's the first thing he's going to ask you. What are you feeding him? Well, he likes candy. He likes that because it's good and sweet. And, you know, he doesn't really like vegetables and milk and that type of thing. He just wants candy. So we give him candy every day. That's where a lot of churches are. Serving nothing but candy. Y'all, y'all know me. There ain't a person on the planet like something sweet any better than I do. But as big and dumb as I am, even I know I got to eat some good stuff every now and then. You got to feed yourself this word of God. You feed it. How do I feed it? You feed it every way you can. You read it. You listen to it. You study it. You, you put yourself in an environment where it is rich. See, a lot of people, that's the problem with being a lone ranger. You're out here doing your own thing. You're not being influenced by other believers. The Bible says it very clearly that we're to fellowship with one another. That's why we have, that's why we eat. And we have that. In fact, we like to eat. But we, we have fellowships to be around like believers. You can't sit and have a, or you shouldn't be sitting and having a conversation while I'm preaching. But it's okay to fellowship before and after. You can get here early and leave late. I've had people come in and go, your church is not friendly. I said, well, you're 15 minutes late getting here and you left before the sermon was over. How in the world is anybody going to be friendly to you if you don't hang around and give them an opportunity? Don't ever tell me my church ain't friendly because I know better. You've got to feed yourself the things of God. No, you don't have to be in this church to get that. I know, I, I get that. I highly recommend it, but I get that. But you gotta, you got to feed yourself to grow. Because right now, like never before, now is the time to prepare for harvest. And you can prepare all your tools. You can sharpen your hose and your axe and, and your sickle and all of those things. You can prepare all of that. But if you don't feed your body, you ain't going to last long out there during that harvest. Anybody in here pick cotton? Yeah. Sister Evans, that's some tough work. I never picked it myself. I, I, I haven't. But my parents laid that on me many, many times. If I ever did anything wrong, because you ain't never picked no cotton, boy. That's the reason you're a brat. You got to prepare yourself. You ain't going to get out there and pick cotton if you ain't eating something. About 10 o'clock, that sun gets high, you're going to start falling down. You're going to fall out. You got to feed yourself. That lighter rain is going to provide that because there's going to be an anointing on everything and you've heard me say this this way before everything is said, sung and done 
is going to have an anointing on it. I believe this is my personal opinion, okay? I always tell you it's my personal opinion. My personal opinion is there's going to be an anointing on everything said, sung, and done that's never been there before. It's going to be at a level that is above and beyond because this revival, this outpouring of God that is coming, and it is coming. Brother Marlin, you've been saying that for years. Yes, I have. I've been believing it for years. And guess what? I still believe it. God tells me something, I take him at his word. He's never lied to me yet. He's never let me down. He's never left me nor forsaken me. He's always been straight with me. And if I just listen to him, he'll tell me the truth. And he's told me that this revival that is coming is going to be unprecedented. In other words, there's never going to been one like it before. There will never be another one like it since. Get ready. Get ready for some lighter rain. Get ready for some things to change. Get ready for an environment that is going to be primed for the move of the Spirit of God like we've never had before. Amen. Now, I apologize I didn't get through this message today, but I'm going to come back. and We're going we're to get through chapter 2 of Joel here because there's so much more, so much more that we need to cover. I'm excited about what God is doing. I want you to be excited. I want people to be on board with what God wants to do, not on board with what I want to do, but on board with what God wants to do. And we here at Crossway Church, we're a, we're a small group of people, but stop counting the numbers that are here to help and start looking at the numbers that we can reach because we can do it. Amen? We just, you, just, you don't have to do what I say. All you got to do is what God says. And hopefully me and God be on the same page. Amen? Remind you of the, of the fellowship here in a moment. Let's, let's uh, Deborah, come on up if you would, please. I don't really have a good stopping point here at this point. But we'll stop at verse 18. I mean, verse uh, whatever we're on. I'll figure it out. Heavenly Father, we come to you on behalf of Texarkana, Lord God, in this surrounding area. There's so many believers out there, Lord, that they're home this morning, Lord God, because they had better things to do. And you're not through with them yet, Lord God. They, they left the church because they were disappointed in the church or somebody did something that harmed them or hurt their feelings or whatever. They just don't have any confidence in the church. And Lord, only you can reach these people because we're going to need those people come harvest time, Lord God. And so we lift up the people of this city. Those that have rejected us. Those that have turned their back on us, Lord God. Those that have, even, even those that have bad-mouthed us, Lord God, we, we love them. And I'm asking that you reach out right now, Lord. You reach out to them. And draw them into your bosom, Lord God. Draw them into this church or another church, wherever, wherever you send them, Lord God, send them. Then they could be part of what you're about to do. That they could be part, Lord God, of this move of God. Don't let them miss it. Don't let them set it out and watch from afar. Tenderize their hearts, Lord God. Let them feel your everlasting, eternal love, Lord God. Minister the sweet things of God to them, Lord God, and woo them back into the kingdom of God, into service, Lord God. Move up on their hearts. Keep playing, Deborah, if you would, please.
Tenderize their heart, Lord God. Minister to their spirit. Feed them the manna from heaven. Feed them the manna that they need. Because manna is from you, it is the perfect food. Totally and completely nutritious to maximize their strength and their health. Move upon this city like never before. I'm going to open up.